may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me be the first to say, welcome to Holy Week. Welcome to the best week of the church year. I love Holy Week. And it's not just because Easter is coming, which it is, and it's good. But it's also about all of the landmarks and the stops along the way that we will observe on the way to Easter and the significance that they hold in our life of faith today. I want to pause for just a moment as we start and stop and offer you a teaching, an explanation that maybe we take for granted as Christians today or maybe we just don't talk about enough, in my opinion. So let me start with this. Our celebration of Holy Week and all the services and all the opportunities to worship coming up Four services, if you count today, which you should, between today and next Sunday, four separate days, four separate opportunities to come to church and worship, they all serve one purpose. One purpose. We want to embody the story of Jesus in our lives today. We want to embody the story of Jesus in our lives today. What do I mean by that? Well, there is so much that happens in this week, the holiest week of the year. And the reason why we have all of these worship opportunities is that we don't just want to remember what happened. We want to intentionally slow down and walk them with Jesus. We use that language a lot during Holy Week. We want to walk with our Lord through the events that happen during Holy Week. We want to relive these most important events in our life of faith. In the church here, we want to be like John and like Mary, who walk with Jesus to each of these places. John and Mary, who would be the last two who were with Jesus on Good Friday at the cross. We want to be like Mary and the women who go to the tomb on Easter Sunday to find it empty. This week is not about, let me say this clearly, this week is not about getting anything from God. This is not a guilt trip. These four opportunities to worship, they are not mandatory for you. You are not obligated to be here by any means. It's not about getting anything from God, earning more love and favor from God. He already loves you as much as he possibly can. You are in the good graces of God because you are his child, who he loves. But these services that are coming up, this story that is going to play out before our eyes, it is eternally significant for you and I today. And so we want to set aside the chaos of our lives more than we do throughout the rest of the year to walk this path with Jesus. We want to embody the story of Holy Week because we know just how significant these days are for us and for our life of faith. And so to help us remember, to help us embody the significance of these events that happened 2,000 some odd years ago, on Thursday this week, we are going to go to the upper room with Jesus and the disciples for the institution of the Lord's Supper. And then the next day, on Friday, we're going to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus will sweat drops of blood as he agonizingly prepares for his arrest, for his betrayal for the trial that will come, the false charges that he's convicted of. We will walk from the garden to the courtroom and the courtroom to Calvary where Jesus will give up his life for us. On Saturday, we will wait in silence as the disciples did. And then next Sunday, we are going to rejoice like the disciples did at his resurrection. We want to relive these events. We want to embody them ourselves in our lives. So let me challenge and encourage you that if you're able, don't skip out on the services that are to come between now and next weekend. Come here again 
experience again, relive, embody these events that have happened. Experience again just what Jesus went through for you. Walk the path to the cross and the empty tomb with Jesus. And believe me, the Holy Spirit will, through the word of God, work in your heart in an amazing way. Don't do it to get anything from God. Don't do it to please God. Don't do it out of obligation or because you feel like you have to. Do it with joy and do it with faith. Do it with reverence for God. So that embodiment of the last week of Jesus' life, it begins here and now today as we celebrate Palm Sunday. And today might be the best example all week of what it looks like to embody the story of what happens to Jesus during Holy Week. Because just like the crowds did on that first Palm Sunday, we are here, just like them, with palms in our hands, waving them, celebrating with Jesus, for Jesus. We still, 2,000 years later, say the same exact words that they did. We say, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We hear the shouts of children welcoming Jesus. And it's almost like if we close our eyes, we're actually there with them on that first Palm Sunday. It's almost like we're in the crowd welcoming Jesus. It's a celebration that we get to participate in. It's a parade, a coronation for Jesus. And these are wonderful, beautiful traditions, meaningful ones that we should continue doing as we embody the story of Jesus and Holy Week. But you see, there's a problem. It's a problem we need to identify. As a preacher, Palm Sunday is kind of a difficult day, to be honest. There's a problem, and it's one that we don't often take the time to identify explicitly. And once we do, it changes how we view Palm Sunday and how we participate in it, too. It's right there in our gospel reading from John chapter 12. Here it is. In a sentence, the crowds who gathered with palms that first Palm Sunday... The ones who shouted praise to Jesus, the same words that we say today, and yes, even the disciples to some degree, didn't clearly understand what was happening or who they were welcoming that day. The crowds didn't fully get what was happening and who was coming right in front of them. Listen again to how John describes that scene, what I want you to listen for is what they say about Jesus, who they say he is, and I want you to listen for what John tells us about why the crowds are there that day. Listen again to John chapter 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. John continues, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. Now listen, get this. The reason why the crowd went out to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. Often, I think, as Christians today, We don't remember that we live on this side of the empty tomb. We look back on Palm Sunday and we expect that the crowd that day knew everything that we know now. Who Jesus was, where he was headed, and why. We assume or we project on them that as they shouted that familiar word, Hosanna, which means something like save us or save now, or even 
maybe even more closely, something like God save the king, that they were referring to the fight against sin and death and the devil that Jesus was there to fight. We assume, we project on them that they were echoing the words of John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But John paints us a totally different picture in his account in the way he recounts the events of Palm Sunday. He explicitly tells us that even though the events of our Old Testament reading were being fulfilled right in front of their eyes, the words of Zechariah chapter 9 were happening, that the king was coming in on a donkey right in front of their eyes, they didn't get it until after Jesus had died and risen. He tells us that the crowds entering Jerusalem with Jesus were following him because he had done the miracle, the sign of raising Lazarus from the dead. It had only happened a day before, and they followed him from Bethany to Jerusalem. And they were still talking about that miracle that he did for Lazarus. They were telling all the other people there that day, hey, this is Jesus. This is the guy that just raised Lazarus. Can you believe it? And John tells us explicitly that's the reason why the rest of the crowd went out to meet Jesus that day. They wanted to see the guy that had just done this awesome miracle. John tells us explicitly they were there because they wanted to see Jesus, the miracle-raising Lazarus guy. Did you catch the language that John records the people as saying to Jesus? They do say, Hosanna, yes, but also, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. That's what John writes. So to put it simply, what they thought they were seeing that day was the new King David coming into Jerusalem, coming into the city where he was going to reign as king. They thought they were seeing a noble lion, to use an analogy, the lion of Judah entering Jerusalem, finally ready to pick the fight with Rome and with Pilate that they had been itching for for so long. This was their earthly king. And notice, Jesus doesn't stop them from calling him the king of Israel either. He allows them to call him that. And so as he comes in on Palm Sunday, they thought they were seeing the new King David, who was finally ready to pick that fight with Rome, pick that fight with Pilate that they had been itching for for so long. Long. Did you notice what they didn't say to Jesus? They didn't use the words Son of God. They didn't use the word Messiah either. So as we embody the story of Palm Sunday, as we relive these events, as we begin Holy Week, We need to burst the bubble that we often allow to falsely cloud our view of Palm Sunday. Because this wasn't a parade or a coronation for Jesus by people that believed he was the Messiah, the one who would free them from sin and death and the devil. It was a crowd saying the right words, but having the wrong understanding of who he was and why he was there. So it's really no wonder, you and I have heard this so often, that the same crowd that was there on Palm Sunday shouting praises to Jesus, six days later is the same one that shouts out, crucify him. And that doesn't make sense to us. How could that be? How could you go from faith and understanding in who Jesus is and six days later to crucify him? Well, John tells us they didn't quite get it at first. You see, we often put ourselves in their shoes and say, well, how could they not get it? How could that happen? It's because we live on this side 
of the empty tomb. We know the whole story. We know where this is going in a way that they did not on Palm Sunday. So as much as we say the same words as that crowd today, we need to make sure that we're saying them for the right reason and with the right Jesus in view. So where does that leave us then? What do we do with Palm Sunday? How do we embody this today? If the whole week, point of this week is reliving, embodying the story of Jesus, walking the path with him, what do we do with Palm Sunday? Well, honestly, the answer is pretty easy, pretty simple, and it only requires us to make one little change. See, we should still shout Hosanna. We should still wave our palm branches. We should still celebrate. Most of what we're doing is very good and right. But we should do that understanding that the Jesus we see coming in on Palm Sunday is the Jesus who was coming in as the Lion of Judah, but who had come to go out like a lamb. We should remember that we know the why more clearly than the crowd did that day. We know why Jesus came. We should remember with a bittersweet reverence that in the words of our epistle, though Jesus was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, even death on a cross. Jesus was, is the king of Israel. He had come in the name of the Lord, but he had come as the lion of Judah who was prepared to be sheared like a lamb on Good Friday. We should keep the words of John the Baptist in mind today that as we see Jesus come in, we should be saying with John, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember, Holy Week happens during the celebration of Passover. So many spotless lambs were being brought into Jerusalem to be sacrificed for sin as they had so many times before, for so many years before. And as the lambs were brought in, so too the Lamb of God came in to be sacrificed, to give himself as the once and for all sacrifice, not to fight Pilate, not to fight Rome, but to fight and defeat and win the victory over sin and death and the devil. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was coming to be sacrificed on the cross. And he did it for you. So that you wouldn't have to endure the pain of eternal death, but that just like we will be celebrating Jesus' resurrection in just seven short days, his resurrection will become your resurrection as well. As we embody the events, as we relive the events of Palm Sunday again today, it's good and it's right for us to celebrate. We're saying the right words. We're doing the right thing. But unlike the crowd, you have a better understanding of who Jesus truly is and why he's come. He's the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world by being sacrificed once and for all for us. So today we do praise Jesus. We do shout Hosanna. We should wave our palm branches. But don't get carried away with the party. This is not only a happy, positive, celebratory day. Because we know what's coming this week. We know the difficulty and the agony of this path that Jesus is walking. We shout Hosanna. We wave our branches because Jesus, the Lion of Judah, has come in like a lion into the city 
so that he might go out like a lamb. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.